Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. There are hard workers in our state who work hard every day, but might find themselves struggling to make ends meet. The latest snapshot of living paycheck to paycheck in Louisiana. There appears to have been a tremendous amount or tremendous volume of brine that was discharged over a long period of time. An alleged casualty of what happens when big oil invades unspoiled nature. They had an extensive trade network, and so it was very important to the economy of the Caddo Nation. A visit inside the acclaimed State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment, but right now on this week's edition of SWI, Catholic Church officials in Homa Thibodeau are naming 14 priests involved in sexual misconduct with children, including rape. The disclosure follows similar ones of Catholic clergy abuse throughout the United States. Also in the news, eight parishes are under a state of emergency because of high river levels caused by so much rain that we've had the past month. Governor John Bell Ed Edwards issued this declaration this week for Beauregard, Bossier, Caddo, Calcasieu, Catahoula, Rapides, St. Tammany, and also Washington parishes. People living in flood-prone areas are urged to stay aware until the threat ends. And now I'll check on some of the other headlines making news across Louisiana. By mid-March, Georgia Pacific says it will lay off 650 workers at its East Baton Rouge plant because of a lessening demand for copy paper. The Communications Paper Division at Port Hudson and the Woodyard, Pulp Mill, and Energy Complex that support it will also close. Area leaders are calling it a gut punch to those losing jobs and the entire region. The company says the layoffs reflect the market shift toward electronic and digital communications. The Ile de Jean Charles community virtually washed away the past 60 years is a step closer to moving to a new home. The state is buying land near Shriver in a federally funded, first of its kind initiative to offer resettlement options to current and former residents. The $11.7 million purchase moves the community about 40 miles north of where it's always been in Lower Terrebonne Parish. The Coastal Protection Authority has finished a $36 million marsh creation project at Lost Lake in Terrebonne Parish. The project benefits almost 1,200 acres. Earthen terraces will break up wave energy to lessen erosion and protect additional areas inland while improving habitat for fish and wildlife. For the second time in three years, the Lower Mississippi River is flooding in January. It's predicted to crest in Baton Rouge at 38 feet during the next week. That's about three feet above flood stage, but nine feet below the levee height of 47 feet. Farther upstream in North Louisiana, the Army Corps of Engineers has begun its early response with its inspection of levees and any construction work nearby. The partial federal government shutdown is causing problems for New Orleans Blood Bank that serves more than two dozen hospitals in Louisiana and southern Mississippi. The nonprofit has already had to cancel two blood drives. Blood drives are often held at federal government buildings or areas with a lot of federal employees willing to donate, and they are now scrambling to find other locations like schools or churches. Governor John Bell Edwards gave a preview of his 2019 legislative agenda this week. It features a few new items, some repeat proposals, and a pledge that he won't call any special sessions during this election year. Pay raises at public schools, a minimum wage increase, equal pay laws, and health care protections are on the governor's to-do list as he seeks re-election to a second term in November. Louisiana has the highest wage gap by gender in the United States. 
That ought to offend everybody. We know that white women earn 70 cents on the dollar. Women of color, about 47 cents on the dollar. We've got to do better than that. The state is getting a $1.2 million grant from the Department of Justice to help in the fight against victims of human trafficking. The money specifically will help fund a federal project known as the Louisiana Child Trafficking Collaborative. Human trafficking is the fastest growing and second largest criminal industry in the U.S. and our state. The governor named January as Human Trafficking Awareness Month in Louisiana. He says to shine a spotlight on the darkness of this senseless crime. Now a story as familiar to Louisiana as our humidity. It continues to play out in an area about 30 miles southeast of Baton Rouge in the Spanish Lake Subbasin. This is an ecological jewel that big oil invaded 80 years ago. One group saying that Shell Oil Company drilling has caused salt kills and aquifer contamination. Shell not wanting to take the blame. Here to discuss this with us, Scott Nesbitt, wetland ecologist, a specialist in the field. Good to have you. And Good Patrick Courage, who was with the Department of Natural Resources. We have an eight-year-old lawsuit here, Spanish Lake Restoration Land Bank versus Shell Oil Company. Drilling began 80 years ago, almost. What's the concern here, Scott? <coughs> well, the concern is that the um, adverse impacts from drilling that have occurred since 1938 and this is still an active oil field, the St. Gabriel oil field, still an active oil field. So the field. drilling continues? Still, it still continues. There's not many wells out there, but there's a few operators. <clears throat> the concern is in the uh, early drilling days, up into the 60s and maybe even a little bit later, there was a discharge by the operators of, uh, of, of processed fluids that were uh, a byproduct of oil and gas exploration. And they're very salty, typically everybody calls, them brine, calls it brine in the old days. But it's uh, very harmful to vegetation if it's discharged on the surface. And there, uh, there appears to have been a tremendous amount or tremendous volume of brine that was discharged over a long period of time. So a lot of cypress trees in this area, rich area for that, but a lot of those were killed because of this. Killed and also the soil really ruined for any regrowth of those trees over time. So really it just killed it, killed the whole area that it impacted, which is still visible is turn in terms of being a low quality habitat today. Patrick, let me ask you, what is the responsibility of natural resources with something like this? Well, in terms of the lawsuit that they filed, this is what they call a legacy lawsuit, which is aimed at dealing with issues similar to this, where you have older oil fields where the damage that's been claimed happened over a long period of time and also often a long time ago, but there's still uh, impacts that you know a plaintiff feels it needs to be dealt with. So the legacy lo lawsuit where it brings us in is when and if the courts determine that there is a company that is a responsible party that should be held responsible for cleanup and there is a cleanup to be done, then they refer it to us to take evidence and information from the plaintiff and the defendant to determine what is called the most feasible plan for the cleanup and then put that back with the court for the court to finally decide whether okay we're going to go with that plan, we're going to go with another plan, we're going to adjust that plan, as the case may be. We see how convoluted that sounds, and Shell saying that they're not responsible, but if all these things have happened over all these years, it's sort of too late to put it back together again if the land has been contaminated and can't be reversed back to the way it was. That's right, it's an expensive fix. And I think, Andre, the point, the reason why I'm here and the reason why we brought this issue forward to the public is that there's a lot of uh, uh, controversy about legacy lawsuits in general. Oil companies uh, and the oil industry doesn't like legacy lawsuits. They think it hurts the industry. Uh, plaintiff, it's a plaintiff. Uh, attorneys run the, run the gamut on it, and it's important for landowners because it's the only representation. However, uh, what is being missed here is that only a portion of the spill and the damage is on our legacy lawsuit land, about 300 acres, but actually the public's resources have been damaged for thousands of acres. And it, it, it's kind of, uh, the public, I'm not sure, is very aware of the fact that it's other people's land and their resources that have been damaged more than ours. So a loss of natural habitat and beauty. What's so special about this area? Well, it's a, it's a forested wetland. It had old growth cypress. It has mature cypress and bottomland hardwood forest. Uh, like all wetlands, it has functional value for storm protection, 
flood storage as we've seen in 2016 that holds a lot of water back right. there, protects a lot of communities, uh, wildlife value, all the, all the traditional wetland uh, benefits are, are, are all concentrated in this 24,000 acres of, uh, the, of the Spanish Lake Subbasin and Basin, Manchac Basin. So it's an environmental jewel. It's clearly in trouble. Is there ever a chance for DNR to jump in and not wait for the process to linger on? Because it can take forever, it seems like. In this case, it's quite possible, but it's quite possible that the our efforts to determine the responsible party through regulatory means might take just as long and have the same issues. So since the court case is already running and this sort of suit was designed to handle exactly this kind of issue, we defer to it in the meantime. However, we do track it. We are monitoring the progress to make sure that the court case is moving forward. If it came to another conclusion, a case where it's dismissed, then we have a, an ability to take action from a regulatory standpoint to say, okay, let's start determining do we have evidence of environmental uh, limits that have been exceeded? And can we establish an active responsible party for that? And then we can take regulatory Is action. Is the case close to wrapping up? We thought it was, but uh, no. there's been another delay. Uh, Shell attorneys have delayed this, this trial for eight years. Um, I, I really, uh, it's very frustrating for the landowner, for, for us to, to move forward. But, uh, but again, uh, to us, it's, there's a, it's a private company, we're private, and we're suing a private company. The big resource impact is to the public. Right. It's not to us. Right, exactly. Okay, so my confusion is kind of, hey, uh, and DNR is overloaded, everybody in the agencies is overloaded. These guys do a lot of work and it's hard. But the, the people that are being hurt are the, is the public at large. Water quality is being damaged. There's still chlorides leaching into Bayou Manchac. Bayou Manchac is, a, is a, somewhat out of compliance. It affects new businesses that want to open up and discharge stormwater into Bayou Manchac. They can't do that because it's out of compliance. So there's an economic driver and that's occurring here. And our ecosystem is right, right. also being hurt. So we would like to see this. that issue take its own course and move forward. We have the data because we paid for the scientific investigation. We've given it to DNR and to DEQ, and they're, they are both waiting for the litigation to be finished. We're hoping that they move on their own because we don't know how long we're gonna be. All right, we'll keep our eyes on it and uh, talk to you again about this. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Meantime, production has begun at Shell's new Alpha Olefins unit at its Geismer chemical manufacturing plant. The plant is the biggest producer of the chemical used in laundry detergents, motor oil, and common plastics. This $717 million expansion broke ground in Geismer back in 2016. A report is out this week putting a spotlight on a big number of people in the state who work hard at jobs that don't pay a lot. They have little or no savings, and they're one emergency from falling into poverty. The Alice Report is the report we're talking about, but there's a good chance you have no idea what that is. Sarah Berthelot, who heads up the Louisiana Association of United Ways, is here to tell us why it's important we understand what it is and first what is A-L-I-C-E, ALICE? What does that stand for? Well, ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. Essentially, they're hard workers in our state who work hard every day, but might find themselves struggling to make ends meet. So a crisis happens and they're in trouble. Well, they're unable to meet a basic survival budget. We can quantify a survival budget for every parish of the state. We know exactly how much one must earn to be able to afford the very basics like shelter, uh, transportation, uh, medicine, uh, food, quality child care for their children. And if they're unable to achieve that budget, then they, they have to make tough choices between those basics. Um, and so we can quantify how many people, how many households in our state face that challenge. And I, I want to show everybody this book right here. You see all this? That is the report for this year. It's, uh, boy, it's big. It's tremendous. Look at that right there. So this is the report on Louisiana, and it is detailed. It is detailed, and it's thick because we provide data at a state level, and so we're able to quantify that while there's 19% of people who struggle with poverty, 
uh, statistically, there's 29% of households in our state that are unable to afford the basics using a, a, a research-based survival budget that's been composed. But it's thick because we also provide that data for every parish and every town for our state. Every parish and every town. So it, it, it is so detailed. So you can pull out one area and tell us what's happening there, for example. That's right. So if someone's working on a project or is leading an initiative and that could impact uh, families in that particular community, we encourage them to review this report, consider the statistics around the economic vitality of families that live in that area, and use it as a tool for decision making and planning. And we invite anyone who's interested to better understand the challenges families face to take a look at the report and use it. We know there's great work that the United Way does uh, all over uh, the nation, but how is United Way working to produce this sort of information and then to help out? Well, United Way uses this information for planning. We, we work really hard to make the greatest impact we can to help the most. And so having access to this data helps us to have a better understanding of the struggle, how we can help and fund the most effective programs to help those that are struggling. And we also are able to share this information with others that are serving families of our state to do the same. And what's the state doing, um, if, if it can do anything uh, at a governmental level to help and assist? Well, one, one element, one thing that really helps Alice is the earned income tax credit. So those working tax credits that help um, provide tax refunds to hardworking families who qualify, in some cases, that is a great opportunity to pay down bills or um, pay tuition or other expenses for the family that have accumulated. And so that's an example of, of something that the state uh, does to help out Alice families. But you know, someone who works hard and at the end of the day is exhausted and then has the stress to know that trouble could be right around the corner. That's right. That is, there's a lot of mental strain and just stress that goes through your body when you're enduring that. Absolutely. And this particular report is uh, used, it is composed using 2016 data. Okay. So it's public data that, that, that reflects that year and, and we all know that 2016 was a tough year for our state. There were two major historical floods sure, absolutely. and there was a series of tornadoes that affected and changed the lives of households and this data set reflects that time period. So we know that during that time, you know, 48% of our families were not really making ends meet right. and they face these really tough disasters. And those are disasters too that you don't snap your finger and bounce back from right. in a month or a, even a year. That's right. In some cases some people are not even back in their homes That's from right. those situations. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Great to talk to you and this is such important information. It's good that we get it out to everybody. And we invite everyone to take a look. You can access the report in full online okay. at launiteway.org look for the state averages, look for your own community. Great. And we welcome you to do that. All right, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. And now we're taking you to the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport. It's a cool place. It offers all sorts of fascinating dioramas depicting life in these lands across the centuries. So we asked curator Nita Cole to introduce some of the museum's most fascinating exhibits, some of which are actually not dioramas at all. At the State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport, we have a wonderful collection of Louisiana's anthropology and archaeological artifacts and history. And this goes back to the very beginning when the museum opened in 1939. We were very fortunate to have um, a trustee named Dr. Clarence Webb who was part of the forefront of the beginning of archaeology in the state of Louisiana. So prior to 1935 there was no archaeology program other than national, international scholars coming in. So Dr. Webb was part of being able to establish a program of scientific study. So we are very fortunate that we have the artifacts from his collection that concentrate on numerous 
tribes within the state of Louisiana, one of which is the Caddo Nation. And Dr. Webb started in the 1930s doing surface collections in the state of Louisiana, and he ended his career in the 1980s with the discovery of a Caddo dugout that was made out of one piece of cypress. So the highlight of the collection here in the Shreveport Exhibit Museum is a 30-foot, 8-inch dugout made out of one cypress tree. It's called a dugout because of the construction technique. They would down a tree and then kill the inside of the tree by setting fires along one side of it. And as the fires smoldered, they would take stone tools and literally dig it out. And that was how the construction was accomplished. The dugouts were used to transport not just people but goods because they had an extensive trade network and so it was very important to the economy of the Caddo Nation. It was located 20 miles north of Shreveport in Red River, buried in a riverbank that was approximately 30 feet tall, and so it had to be literally excavated or dug out. The dugout had to be dug out of the riverbank, and at the time of its discovery in 1983, it was the biggest, longest, Native American vessel yet discovered. Since that time, others have been located, one of which last summer showed up on a sand bore approximately in the same location as this one, and it's 34 feet long. However, it is not as old as the one here. Uh, the dugout within this museum carbon dates to 1035 AD. The new one that was discovered is 1370 AD. So this one's a little bit older, but interestingly enough, a, exactly the same technique of being a dugout where they would smolder the tree and then dig it out with stone tools. Our dugout is a cypress tree, so it would have been one of the old cypresses. We also have a, a slice of a cypress tree in another part of the museum that's approximately the same age. I think it's 980 tree rings on it. So there were virgin cypresses here in northwest Louisiana. Most people think of the Mississippi River as being where the cypress trees grow, but they're here along the river basins along Red River. Adjacent to the gallery of the Caddo Nation is a gallery of Poverty Point, and it is anchored by a diorama that was constructed on the direction of Dr. Clarence Webb. He and the archaeologist Dr. James Ford, who was the first archaeologist in Louisiana in 1935, worked for 20 to 30 years to excavate and research and produce the first official site report on Poverty Point in 1958. The diorama is based on their research and it shows activities within the site which dates to 1550 BC. So it's a 3500 year old culture and at the time of its existence would probably have been considered one of the largest cities in America. It was trade based they negotiated with peoples living in what is now Georgia, Alabama, the southeast, up and down the Mississippi River Basin, and their specialty was making jewelry. They imported rock because it was difficult to obtain rock in the state of Louisiana because of all the, the rivers and the mud. So they imported rock and they made spear points and uh, other stone tools. Another of the wonderful things to see at the State Exhibit Museum is a collection we call Autographing History, and it's 54 original autographs from America's founding fathers, starting with George Washington. We have a full-page letter that is signed by George Washington and going all the way through Abraham Lincoln and U.S. Grant. So we have them listed kind of in groups where you can go through and kind of pick out your favorites. We have a John Hancock, which is a wonderfully clear autographed. We also have uh, a Benjamin Franklin. And along with that, we have grouped a very nice Louisiana exhibit on the Battle of New Orleans. So we've got Andrew Jackson and we've got W.C.C. Claiborne's autograph, who was the first governor, territorial governor, and then the first elected governor of the state of Louisiana. So there are several cases with artifacts in it. And then there's also a mural painting that depicts the battle that is part of that exhibit. 
We have probably 60,000, over 60,000 visitors per year. That includes uh, student groups as well as numerous out-of-state visitors. Nita Cole, thank you so much for all that information. The Battle of New Orleans, by the way, was fought this week 204 years ago, January 8, 1815. That was on a Sunday. The United States Army led by General Andrew Jackson against the British. And that is our show this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or your tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB News and Public Affairs shows and other other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.